Hey everybody, welcome to a pretty special feature that we have for you today here at Cycle News. Um, now look, if you're like me, you love superbike racing. Uh, I was very lucky to grow up, I think, in the golden era of the World Superbike Championship, um, you know, back in the days in the 90s, uh, the days with like Colin Edwards, Carl Fogarty, Anthony Gobert, all those historic legendary names, you know, superbike racing was pretty much bigger than Grand Prix racing back in the mid 90s. and. Uh, so we're pretty lucky to grow up around that time to see those incredible races. But, you know, the side product of that is that the 1990s produced some pretty cool bikes. Um, you know, back in the days you had stuff like the Honda RC45, which we rode just up there. So if you ever want to go and check that out, please do so. Uh, but yeah, you had the Honda RC45, you had the Yamaha YZF750, um, Kawasaki ZX7RR, all those really, you know, legendary bikes. But as legendary as they all were, they were always second place in the public uh, public's eye. Because in 1994, which is 25 years ago to this year, in 1994, Ducati released the beautiful, iconic This lovely man to my right, Mr. Dan Trotty, he is what we call Ducatisti. You know, the, the guy bleeds red blood. He he loves that kind of stuff. He, he's got, a, what have you got? You got a triple eight, you've got a triple eight. Uh, I have this, I have the hooligan, the, the super hooligan scrambler. Yeah. I have a multistrada. Multistrada. And over the years I've had lots and lots of di the, yeah. I've had lots and lots of uh, Ducatis over the years, including 749, 999. Wow. I have a 450 RT dirt bike. Wow, far out. So yeah, this. So he's real into it, this guy. Um, but this is a pretty special bike. I mean, in throughout the course of Ducati, particularly Ducati Superbikes, they obviously had special edition bikes, um, sport production bikes, as they were called. Um, so yeah, you had 94, 95. They were the and for this bike, 916 SP. They were 955 CC. Well, they sold a 955 kit for US yeah. uh, AMA racing um, and those have special case and you know they're they're pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. So that were the, the the in ninety six they had the nine one six SPA, like SPA in Correct. America. Mm, yeah. Correct. Um, and again it was for homologation purposes for racing in the United States. Yeah. And the, you, you know the uh, superbike series here. Mm. So like the SPS brand, like this is what they homologated to go superbike racing in. Correct. Yeah, in uh, 97, 98, they increased the uh, uh, the di displacement rules for twins, so they were allowed to go up to 996 cc's. Yeah. So this bike was the first of the 996 cc displacement. Yeah. But it's still considered a 916. Right. But they had to uh, change the the heads and barrels and reinforce the cases and. They did a lot of trick things to the SPSs that the normal Stratas or the regular monoposts didn't get. Yeah, like this thing had like titanium cover rods and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, they lightened you know the flywheel, the crank, yeah. titanium uh, connecting rods, uh, close ratio gearbox, yeah. uh, different cams. So it uh, produces power like a superbike. Yeah. So how long you had this bike? I got this back in 2007. Right. So the market was soft considering this bike brand new in 98 was 24,000. Wow. So that was a lot of money for these bikes. And you wait a little bit, like you were saying about the modern classics, uh, you know, they went through their period, you know, of just being old bikes. And now people are starting to realize that yeah. these are the bikes that they, we all dreamed of as a, as a kid. You know, I, like you, I grew up in that same era of watching super bikes. And always wanted one of these, but I, I wanted to have the right one. Yeah, so this was like after doing a little bit of research, like this was the first 916 SPS or the first SPS slash SP that was more commercially available. They made over a thousand of these things. Yeah, I think the number is something like 1,050 or something. Yeah. So, yeah, it was definitely uh, 
you know, produced in higher numbers uh, globally, but for the U.S., they are pretty rare because they came in as off-road, you know, yeah. off-road use only. Yeah. You had to sign a waiver with Ducati, yeah. stating that you would never ride these on the street. Right. Yeah. So that, that's a, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Like, how did how did that work? How? Well, the problem is, is you know, trying to get the horsepower that they were out of these, yeah. and complying to, especially with carb, yeah. you know, you know, U.S. EPA regulations. It wasn't uh, an easy task, and I think they they realized that to go through the process of trying to homologate for uh, emissions, getting that kind of horsepower out, mm -hmm. it was probably going to be more work than it was worth. Yeah. But that also means that these are pretty rare in the United States because who's going to go out and spend that kind of money yeah, yeah. on an off-road only bike? Mm -hmm. But some of them did slip through, <laughs> including this one. Including this one. That's what we like. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I just I keep looking at little bits and pieces on it, like carbon chain guard. I, mean, I, mean, I think the the strangely for me the most nine one six piece of this bike uh, that I would just remember, I had a poster of this thing on my wall, um, and it had that had the typical shot of the of the chick where she was like doing yeah, that at yeah. the front. And, uh, but I always remembered this thing, the bloody gold rear wheel. Yeah, I just love that that three spoke gold rear wheel. It just Pops. Oh right, and, then, and this is a this is one period correct for this bike, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you know, a lot of people they preferred the aesthetics of the five spoke that came later. But personally, I am with you. I love the three spoke, the gold yeah. popping. You know, they later went to you know gray frame, and yeah. for me, the the gold frame, similar to you know the the eight eight eight, had the same color yeah. combination. The one one thing that I really love about the 98 SPS other than all the performance upgrades is that it's the simplest graphics yeah. that Ducati ever put on a bike at that point. Mm -hmm. They went away from the big graphics on the side and went to just a very simple yeah. clean look and allowed the, the, those details to speak for themselves. Yeah. With all the little lines and shapes mm -hmm. that Tamarini yeah. incorporated into this. Yeah, you see, uh, I, I prefer the, the big Ducati 916 down the side. I want everyone to know that I'm riding a 916. But yeah, I mean, they didn't even have, like, they took, there's no Ducati on the tank nope. or anything. No. Nope. I mean, there's a, there's a tiny little. SP, you know, and that, that's how you know it's an SPS. Yeah, a tiny little thing at the back there. But yeah, what a beautiful bike. Yeah, and this is all period correct, um, mostly stock. Yeah. I, I have uh, period correct rear sets on it, but that's. Because uh, at you know, my age, trying to get on one of these things, they're not the most comfortable bike for long distance riding. So being able to adjust them yeah. for a little bit more comfort. Yeah, yeah. but you've got, uh, you got the front, you got, you got a Ducati racing clutch there. Yeah, you know? all that's DP. All the carbon fiber is you know, stock to the bike. Yeah, cool. Fantastic. Well, look, enough chatting. Let me get on that ride. All right. All right, let's do it. As you would have just seen then, sometimes getting these things started isn't always a given. Oh dear, come on. There we go. Alright, now we're good. This thing's got a very tall first gear, so have to be careful getting them off the line. Alright, here we go. Alright, so now that we're out of the traffic, can actually explore this thing a little bit. 
And one of the things that the 916 was known for was its ability to absolutely smash corners. <laughs> oh, it just stays so lovely. I mean, I don't like to use the term like a 250. It doesn't steer like a 250. It still steers like a big bike. But it steers beautifully. I mean, like, those of you that had an eagle eye will, will notice that the uh, tires on this thing back there before were not exactly brand new. But it doesn't seem to matter. The chassis is just so beautiful and poised that it just steers telepathically. This is where the, nine, the 916, 996, this is where it shines. Twisty roads, no one on. I mean, it shines better on a, on a, on a racetrack, but we couldn't get the time to get out there, unfortunately. Plus, it stands pride and joy, this thing, so I didn't want to... Uh, I didn't want to... Bust it for him. Woo! Gotta be careful on this thing. It's not exactly arm wrenching power either. Like, compared to a modern bike, I use this term with the RC45, but compared to a modern bike, it feels more like a 750. It doesn't feel like a 600. It feels a bit more punchy than a 600. But the Yassi 45 certainly felt like a 600. I mean, that thing only had 100 horsepower. Anyway, this thing's probably got about 120 odd. Like, it depends who you ask what these things used to do. You know, some people say 130, other people say 115. The general consensus from what I sort of could find out really was around 120. People take, depends on who's operating the dyno, I guess. So yeah, it does have a little bit more punch, but that immediate torque off the bottom end, which is obviously what Ducati's been known for forever, um, that's, that's been their MO. It's very, very smooth. Um, it's smooth, but you know, it's immediate, it's punchy. Uh, it has, a, has an eagerness to it. Um, it's, not like, it's not like jumping on a final edition, a Panigale 1299 final edition, that feels like it wants to break your nose with how much power it's got. This thing is much more of a, you know, this is a dancer, you know, the, the 1299's a boxer, the 996, 916, you know, these are dancers, these are, these are the, uh, the ballerinas, these things, they're just beautiful things, they tiptoe around corners. This is an absolutely box standard road bike, created its uh, homologation special road bike, still a standard road bike. One of the lads going past, but it just—I love the way this thing steers. And another thing which I've noticed how nice I, I really enjoy is the gearbox action on this thing. It's beautiful. It's so sweet for a 20. What this thing's what 21 year old uh, gearbox. It's beautiful. It's so smooth. It just sneaks into gear. Lovely, lovely feeling. A lot of modern day gearboxes could learn a thing or two from, from this thing. So this area has had a lot of rain recently, so I'm keeping my eye out to make sure that everything's still open. All right, we've got eight miles of twisties. This is, this is what's up. Yeah, like it just won't, that's third gear. It just winds up nicely. Brakes are not amazing. They're not terrible, but they're certainly not amazing. Oh, look at that, side to side. Yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, this thing's sex. Yeah. Get into it. And there's the knee. Woohoo! everywhere around this place too so got to be careful oh, it just loves it it's so smooth in the way this thing turns man Ducati got this thing so right yeah 
Whew. Sorry, there's a lot of yeahs and blues here, but I'm having a good time, boys and girls. I just can't believe how poised the chassis is. It just loves it. Oop. A little bit hot in that. Just loves banking in the corners. The road's super dirty here too. So when I was saying before about the so when I was saying before about the tank and how it's very very slim, conversely it's also quite difficult to grip, and I'm feeling that right now. I'm, so, I'm a big uh, fan of ripping the hell out of the tank with your knees, and uh, this thing very difficult to do. You need to probably put some of that gripper adhesive stuff on this tank, but I mean, God, why would you ever want to put some of that stuff on the tank? Yeesh. Road's a little dirty here. Tiptoe around here. Tell you what, it's certainly not the most comfortable bike to ride. It's good when you're giving it to it, and it must be amazing on track. But with this straight up comfort, it ain't it ain't a lot. Yep. Yep. It's no, as you said before, it's no exaggeration to say that this thing really did save the Ducati motorcycle company. Uh, they were not in very good financial shape back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. So, yeah, they were not in good financial shape back then. Um, they had all kinds of issues trying to, I mean, half of these bikes were, the early edition bikes were built in Bereza in the north of Italy, and then eventually the factory of Bologna tooled up, and that's now obviously where all the Ducatis are made, but Ducati was still a powerhouse, so it was still one of the world's great motorcycle makers, but it had been passed around a bit like a hot potato as well, but in 1996, uh, I think it was 96, uh, around that time, the uh, the Texas Pacific Group (TPG) they owned Ducati. They bought Ducati off the Castiglione's. Uh, Castiglione's went back to doing the Augusta. And uh, one of the big things that TPG did was they really tried to improve the build quality. Early 916s were plagued with all kinds of issues, predominantly electronics issues bolts and regulators, rectifiers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was, they, were, they had some major electronics issues that caused a number of recalls as well. But now the, uh, like the TPG group, the TPG, they, they ended up putting a lot of effort into quality control. Uh, they changed the Japanese ignitions and just changed, just fixed up a few things because the base package was so good that they didn't need to do a lot. They just needed to fix a lot of little, little things. Uh, nothing major. And as a result, it basically put Ducati towards, you know, the, the path that it's, that it's on now being, being one of the, the biggest and most successful companies in the world. I mean, it's still, the financials of the company are, are very, very good. I mean, they're owned by the Volkswagen Group now, which owns Audi and all that stuff, so they're part of the world's biggest automotive uh, conglomerate, I guess. However, the, uh, they still do want to sell them. <laughs> uh, Volkswagen Group obviously got very sim sim uh, seriously hammered when they had the emissions uh, issues, but uh, you know, part of the deal was they were thinking of selling Ducati to recoup some of that money, but anyway, uh, going off track a little bit here, but it all started, you know, when and TPG got TPG got on this, got on, got a hold of this brand, they increased the quality control, and really started to fix this brand up. They really got there, really got it going again, and um, you know, they've 
they've done some exceptional things. I mean, now that Ducati are who they are, they've just done some astounding bloody things. You know, though some of the bikes that they've made have just been gorgeous. But still, nothing tops the 916 in my opinion. And you know, I had I actually got it many years ago, many, many, many years ago. I got to ride one of these things when it was brand new. When I was 16, funnily enough, I don't know how I managed to swindle that. But I also uh, didn't appreciate what I was riding and you know the the, the importance of of this bike. Which is a bit, a bit crappy here. Uh, I didn't appreciate the importance of this bike and just what it meant to world motorcycling and especially to superbikes. Um, you know, the superbikes kind of, the Japanese kind of forced the hand with superbikes. You know, they pushed them into the monsters that they are now. Uh, you know, being 1,000cc four cylinders that are capable of 230 plus horsepower and race trim. These things were not like that. You know, you might be, I'm guessing, probably 150, 160 horsepower on a fully raced up factory built 996. You know, that's, that's still a lot of horsepower, don't get me wrong, but it's not the kind of levels they're putting out now. There was a little bit of, there was more grace to these bikes than, than what was, uh, than what was currently afforded. Oof, gee, we've already got snow on the road. We've got up a little high. Um, there was more grace to these bikes, you know, there was a bit of finesse. Uh, it wasn't quite the heavy hitting boxer bikes that they are now. Um, but look, what a bike, man. I'm, I'm thrilled and very honoured that Dan lent this bike to me so I could sort of fulfil a bit of a boyhood dream and get to ride a 916. And really, I'm riding the ultimate evolution of the 916 before it became the 996, even though, as we have said before, this is a 996cc motor. But yeah, a stunning, uh, a stunning piece of equipment, this. Uh, Massimo Tamburini he built this when he designed this bike I wish I was in his design office when he put the pen down and took a back took a look back and just gave himself a little bit of a pat on the back because he truly created one of the most beautiful road going machines ever created car bike truck whatever you want this is one of the most gorgeous automotives or automo automobiles ever been made and uh, yeah I'm very pleased to have written it.